In the words of Comrade Lenin, what's to be done? I want to yield my time in the first question to anybody in the audience. This has been, or these two talks have been riveting, um, Olympian, and um, a lot. So who has a question? I'm not going to do the ash thing about the tenor and the comment thing, and there is a question. Yeah, there is one, yeah. Uh, hello. Thank you very much for uh, both of your talks. Um, you, you both emphasized the logics of uh, algorithms, and you hinted at that these algorithms are programmed, trained, operated by people. So I was wondering if um, both of you could also speak to the sociological aspects of the technologies, right? Because the technologies function in a, in a certain way. They develop an increasing forms of cognition. But on the other hand, uh, there are annotators of uh, artificial intelligence. There are operators of smart CCTVs and so on. Um, and of course, they do not see things in the same way. So there's also a politics of the operation and the programming that is not necessarily just coloniality or you know, it's one single vision of race. There is conflict, heterogeneous positions, uh, debates and arguments about how these things should be programmed, operate, and so forth. So I was wondering if you could expand on these aspects. I take, I, I will point out to something. You started your question, your inquiry, with uh, that we both painted algorithms as evil. And I want to problematize that uh, statement because this is how um, progress is prevented from happening. Because we tend to look at certain systemic issues in uh, terms of evil or monstrous or something that other people do and not something that we're all immersed in and that we all, by virtue of being part of the culture, are you know, participating in. So I want to problematize that. I think that calling our vision of algorithms or of artificial intelligence is evil is simplistic and not very useful. In any case, what I think, we, I'm not speaking on behalf of both of us, but I'm saying what I understood from Ramon's um, presentation and from mine, what we are both saying is that these are systemic issues that we have been dragging from the last uh, 600 years. As such, I don't think that anyone can say this is evil or this is bad or this is good. This is what it is. It's capitalism, it's patriarchy, it's racism, it's who we are collectively, all of us. Some of us occupy one space within this system, others occupy other spaces because these systems are hierarchical. But none of us are can be separate from this. So because the question, your question was formulated in such a way, I feel a difficulty because it feels like you are wanting exoneration here. Tell me that the way that some people program is not evil. No, of course not. Of course not. I don't think anyone is either evil or monstrous. It's who we are. The only way that we're going to break that pattern is by observing these systems and by actually unpacking the way they function. But I mean, picking up, picking up on that point, I think, I think it's necessary to, sort, to delineate the logics of symbolic mathematics from the operation of symbolic mathematics. And the problem with machine learning or artificial intelligence is those two get conflated. Um, and, and it also contributes to the, uh, the problematic of language. You know, intelligence, smart. You know, all of those very anthropocentric terms that we assign value to become a problematic in the space of itself. And, and this is something that I, I attempt to address. Um, uh, Shameless Plug just published an uh, essay in, in Eflux about this 
using artificial, using the algorithm itself as if it is a human function. And I think in the process of thinking about this as if, you know, there is an element of this idea of exoneration. And, and I feel, not to speak for Flavia, but we're, what we're trying to do is return to the actual logics that, made, that, 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 that form the conditions to make it possible. And what I mean by that is actually if you return to the 16th, 17th century and even the emergence of statistics within the 17th century prior to machine learning, which was invented in 1980, we could actually have this same conversation. Because instead of the coder, it was the statistician. So what I, what I mean by that, what I, what I mean by that is the, there's a propensity to see our contemporary engagements with machine learning as something that's new. What we're trying to highlight is the, this, is a, this is a new node in a durable, continual system that actually has been around for some time and will continue to be around as we go to this. So, return, so to return to the sociological type of matrix, I mean, it's, it in itself becomes you know, I hate to put it this way, but a bit nonsensical because the assumption there is that we're not already in a parasitic relationship with any technology that we have. So to say, let's look at the relation between the humans and the, and the algorithm, already we're a step prior to that. And of course, these violences produce things that are other than race. And I think that's what, you know, I would encourage you to read some Fanon because what he actually says in the end, when he gets, when he gets to his proposal, on colonialism, what he actually emer what actually emerges is is a function of pathological violence that lives within us, that then gets articulated as racism, homophobia, misogyny, so on and so forth. So if if racism's not your thing, then I would encourage you to look at the recording and replace your thing with it, homophobia, and you'll get the same result. So so in that in in that way in that way in that way and the final part our answer to this in that way one of the things I'm proposing is a different type of awareness. I mean I used to be an engineer. I know how engineers are trained, without relation. The engineers are not trained in a sociological space. That comes retrospectively. And what hap and what happens in this sense and the reason why I return to symbolic mathematics is because an algorithm is nothing more than a step by step instructions of symbolic mathematics which were derived centuries ago based on political and social philosophy and I would I would challenge anyone to think about any component of machine learning algorithm that wasn't derived from an ideology such as Linnaeus Pascal Leibniz so on and so forth and these ideologies derived from a certain type of ordering and world making. For Leibniz, it was creating a universal system of knowledge. It was subsuming motion into a single comprehensible stack. And he made the differential equation to accomplish that ideology. In the contemporary, we take that for granted. We see a differential equation and we take it as if the divine just dropped it on the planet like an asteroid. <laughs> and I think that that is the particular challenge. I see in your face you're not satisfied with the answer, so I'm assuming you're a coder. But, <laughs> but we forgive but, you. <laughs> yes. But I think you know. I think it's worth you know maybe either elaborating on that so you can get more satisfaction. I'm, I'm going to cut I'm this conversation can short. Can I just no, say something? Is, no, we're going to do this uh, over coffee or tea afterwards because I want to give more people the opportunity to ask questions because I see hands. Uh, I don't want to be rude, seen but someone, I, I've not just never seen two speakers ignore the question to such extent and assume. Can you yeah. with the arrogance to reclaiming my time, time reclaiming my time oh, that, reclaiming my oh, that, time oh, we oh, go over yeah. there yeah. Well, I, I mean, the I, mean I, I, res I, re I respect that I mean we're not I mean I mean speaking speaking you know have, may not have read it thoroughly it's the difference between reading and reading <laughs> so I, I think I think the propensity is you know, when we're, when we're dealing with data politics and algorithmic culture, I think it actually lends itself, and even I find your debate to be actually useful. And it's helpful to think of us, I, I mean, we're not, we're not robots, we're not algorithms, and we're also fallible. And I think that the point we're trying to make is the fallibility of these technologies within these systems. Okay, can you repeat your question? Sorry, I'm just I'm not going to monopolize the flow. My question was very simple. 
machine learning includes annotators, yes. co coders yes. that set the parameters, yes. and operators of the technologies. Yes. And I was just wondering whether you could speak more about their role and their conflictual visions right. of how these things should be done. I was not ignoring uh, race. Okay. I was not okay. ignoring anything. Sorry, I may, I may be misunderstood. I may be misunderstood but your question. That's not the way the question yeah, was articulated. Question right. Okay, let me. This let is me, a new question. Let me step. Let me step this down. Of, <laughs> this is a new let me, question. <laughs> let me. Let me. Let me do a step by step of the relation of the relation between the human and the algorithm. Right. Machine learning, as I said, machine learning, as I said, is a self-learning system that uses algorithms, which are step-by-step -step functions of of symbolic mathematics. They are coded through existing coding languages, which you have to understand that underneath the coding languages, your Python, so on and so forth, are symbolic mathematics that are actionable. So when the people, when we call these people to say, what is their accountability? What I just said is when I went to engineering school, this is what informs it, is we turn on the machine, we turn on the terminal, we start typing in symbolic mathematics, which are already racial without any awareness that is racial. And then after machine learning produces something racist, then we're all surprised. So, so really what I'm returning to the point is, is this idea of a human relationship, it lives beyond the actual operational function of, of what you're actually seeing. And that relationship isn't fine tuned. It's not like everyone who works at Google is just evil bastard that's trying to destroy no. the world. <laughs> Some. Some. <laughs> there's, there's, a, well, there's a couple of questions here. Uh, maybe have... Get a mic. Okay. Can we get a microphone over here as well for the next one? Um, my, my question involves um, both we? talks, but specifically Ramon's. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you both because your talks were uh, an enactment of and uh, an example of the kind of minoritarian politics that we need, I think, so thank you very much. Um, but Ramon at some point said um, we must resist and leaving aside for the moment who this we is, because mm -hmm. we could debate that for a long time, um, I'd like to ask you about how you think we should resist. And more specifically, um, referring to a problem that is well known in the philosophy of technology, um, which is that of black boxing, no pun intended, but um, the idea is that uh, the more successful applications a techno technological artifact has, the more it re withdraws itself from our sight. So it yeah, becomes more and more difficult to analyze the inner workings of a technological object, the more self-explanatory, so to speak, its success is. And you raise a very interesting thinker, namely Simon Don, so I thank you for that as well, um, because his work is tremendously powerful in thinking through the ways in which we come to individuate technological objects. So we can uh, perform the, the, the theory of operations he refers to, the, the alecmatics. And um, your question? My question is, um, as an engineer, you know very well how code works, and as such, you're well equipped to resist. Um, my question is, how do you think that expertise and resistance are connected and perhaps dependent on each other? Yeah, I, I think, thank you for that question. Um, for me, what I'm thinking through in the research right now, that's why it's a bit experimental, is because, because we're dealing with functions of symbolism, we are highly lodged in issues of representation. Right? And this implicit assumption that the violences that we experience, even unwittingly, you know, through machine learning and algorithmic, algorithmic intelligence is a function of just inserting some form of difference with Flavio was sort of saying. You know, you insert a body into it and then thus it becomes more inclusive. Um, in terms of resistance, I'll take a quick aside, is, you know, something that Jody Dean in the, uh, you know, speaks on quite differently in terms of comradeship and solidarity is resistance does not happen in a singular space. That is a very Western construct. And it ends up being a tension even in leftist types of politics that are there. You know, my particular choice is to fight this resistance in terms of philosophy because what I've understood in my research and earning my arrogance was that, <laughs> was that actually a lot of the tools that we use technologically are first derived in philosophy. And at the same time, simultaneously, then you have scholars and researchers, even coders, who are dealing with the immediacy of the concern, who are looking at immediate ways to disrupt it. 
And in a way, why, why I make that connection between the genealogy, you know, especially ontologically in something like Fanon, is thinking about how those two spaces can enact themselves at the same time. For me personally, when we think about the black box, the black box was not invented in 2000 and whatever. The black box was actually invented in the 17th century when Leibniz proposed to the Prussian government that he could give them statistical data to assess the power of their military. That was the first black box system. And since then, the nation state has enacted certain types of black box systems. So, so in a way, what we see as a black box data is just a new articulation of, of what was there. So how do we resist then in that sense? And I think what I'm trying to derive from in my research right now is thinking of a non-representational -represent, rep way in which each one of us in our own particular situations can gain an awareness and, and an interconnectedness with the other to resist the capacity within the specific situation that we're in. So if I'm someone like Joy Balamwini and I'm dealing with facial recognition software, then I, I resist there. If I'm someone else that's just a user dealing with a Google algorithm, I resist in that mode. For us, we were, dis we're resisting discursively because there's a new generation that's, that's coming that needs this type of information. So I hope that answers a bit of, of the question. Now what that resistance might mean is just as complicated and unsatisfying as resisting capitalism in itself. There's no answer yet. They're one and the same. <laughs> yeah, I think that they're one and the same. Resisting technology at this point is resisting capitalism. Yeah. How well that, that that's that's multiplicity, you know, like, yeah. and, that, and 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 I wanted to tie to what you said about the first black box, just like the first big data project for me are the archives of the uh, transatlantic slave trade, yeah, yeah. and all the the bodies that were transported as units of cargo. That's the first recorded case of big data that we have to contend with. Yeah. And I, I think you know if we think in terms of you know. Fred Moten, and Stefano Harney's, you know, the idea of the uncommon, the idea of the fugitive. In a way, that's what they're saying, is they're saying, okay, the black body, the racialized body, the body that has, has actually subsumed violence to its core can enact a process of, of complete rejection. And that's why I was posing that question. What happens when someone doesn't want to enter into machine perception, this right of refusal? And if we think about it on an individual pathological sense in this right of refusal, in a way, little trickets are already happening. I mean, it may be two or three people, but I've heard of so far that have now realized their role in Silicon Valley and have stepped away, a right of refusal. And maybe that's not sufficient now, but as we collect different forms of resistances, this may actually amplify into something. But first, we have to see the logics for what they are. Right? You're, not, you're not advancing technology, you're advancing capitalism. And once you realize that, you can enact different decisional frameworks. So we're trying to break the illusion, I guess I was trying to say. Who dares to ask the question now? <laughs> so many hands, uh, yes. Hi. Um, yeah, then you have the microphone, uh, go ahead. Hi, um, I'd like to thank you both for the nice talks. Uh, here. <laughs> I have a question that um, it's kind of past this stage of what you talked about. We are, we're having these algorithms operate nowadays and we accept them. But what we can still do is still steer how they work and uh, uh, make them represent all of us equally, right? Uh, my question is about how do we assert representations? Because these algorithms operate on data that they have already seen. And what algorithms learn are basically based on the distributions of data they have already seen. And just to give an example, if you train a face recognition system on data from certain people, you want everyone to be equally represented so that faces will be recognized. How do we ensure representation without categorization? Um, no, you don't. You don't want, every, this is the problem of representation because we haven't solved the problem of imperialism and capitalism, right? We have to solve that first because right now facial recognition is horrible at recognizing brown and black bodies. That's a good thing. 
that means that resistance groups in the global south have a few milliseconds of freedom. <laughs> if you include them, basically what you have done is made the empirical, you made the empirical machine more efficient at identifying the bodies it's already oppressing. So it's not just about inclusion. It's not, it's not going to make a racialized body feel better that a facial recognition can, can, you know, can identify them. I don't need an automatic soap dispenser to dispense me soap. I'm okay with it not working. If it means that someone, someone that's being identified by a militarized drone is not detectable. And I think what we're trying to pick up is these taxonomies that make up artificial intelligence, they're portable. What runs Google search in it is what runs a militarized drone. And that's important to understand. So we have to be careful in terms of resistance and the idea, the sort of idea of multiculturalism, everyone needs to be included in a way in thinking diversity. about- Diversity. Yeah, ex diversity. exactly. Because that's in, the world. In, in this sense, we are already ranked and categorized. They should, and this happens in, in all my lectures and all the discussions I have, we tend to look at the technology as the problem. And then people ask me, last night I had another lecture uh, about the relationship of, of labor and algorithms. They said, well, but, but what do we do? How do we solve the algorithms? No, the algorithms are not the problem. We need to fix the culture. The problem is the imprint that we have. The, cal the, 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 the algorithms are symptomatic of something else. And until that something else is not solved, the algorithms are going to continue reproducing this. And to go back to what we were saying before, not because the people creating the algorithms are, are evil, but because this has been naturalized. And the, the issue is how do we solve the algorithms? Well, we solve the culture first. Um, yeah, can I make a counterpoint to that? <laughs> I, where are we now? Here. Yeah, uh, yeah so it has been said already a few times, but uh, you said in the, uh, Ramon said in the talk, uh, they asked about the difference between machine learning and statistics, and I would say uh, machine learning relies on big data, and it's actually not the algorithms that are prejudiced, it's the, the, it's the data sets. Um, and for instance, uh, if you think about uh, uh, Google, it started off first and privileged people get to use it and they get to fill the data set and then it works better for privileged people and there you go. But it's, it's, it's not privileged people get to use Google because what Google is proficient at is using all of its free platforms to centralize its idea of data collection. So basically all yeah. of us right now have contributed to that algorithm. If you have your mobile phone on, the moment you stepped on the tube, the moment you crossed the CCTV Right, but there are camera. still four billion people without mobile phones who also like, Abs you know, absolutely. they're not contributing to this data set. It, I just want to make clear that, that the algorithms no, are not No, but this is, this is not, actually this, this is not actually what I stated. I said an algorithm is a step-by-step -step function of symbolic mathematics that depend upon discrete forms of data. So if you take away the mathematics from that, that data derives from our collective social body. Of course it's biased already because it already mirrors what we think of as a social relation. And what Flavia is basically saying is, we're, I mean, one, we're not technophobes, but also we're not blaming the algorithm and also not blaming the data. Because it's in, in a way, I would even challenge well, your question. Why not though? No, because, because in a way, because what, what machine learning does is correlate data. Right. So it associates black woman with rage. If it just produced black woman, it's just black woman. If it just produced rage, it's just rage. What statistics allowed machine learning to do was make the correlation between two points right. of existence. So, so it's not even just simply that idea of data, and that's why I go back to the Prussian Empire with Leibniz, is because the state had already been aggregating data. How many cows do you have? How much hay do you have? How much land? It was Leibniz who went to the Prussian Empire and said, guess what? You can correlate the number of cattle to military power. And here's how we can calculate that, because then you can feed your soldiers. And then they said, well, soldiers are male, so then now I can correlate birth records to the amount of soldiers. And then I can correlate, and if I need to feed a soldier, then I, and I know how many males are born in this particular province, but then I'm gonna, as a state, distribute more food 
to but, that province. But can, that, I why is that can I ask a question to the room? How many people here are coders? <laughs> well, designers, software engineer, people that code, work with systems. Because it feels like the coders are, are asking most of the questions now. And I want to give uh, more space to the artists. And, and I know I there's one artist here in the room who's, who's involved in the exhibition who feels very close to this. But I, I was I wondering really if she had a question uh, for the panel, and she has not. So I'm not going to... Can you finish this yeah, question? Just one short thing. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're still going to get way more data points from, let's say, some San Francisco hipster with an iPhone 12X Absolutely. Uh, than from someone in India who's barely managing. Right? Absolutely. So, so anything that... It w but then why are we surprised? If I, can, if I can aggregate more data sets from a Western context who already has a history of racism, then why are you surprised that the algorithm's racist? No, I'm, I'm, well, I wouldn't say the algorithm is racist. I'm saying the data set is collected somehow and incentivized to take the data from that Western thing. It I still mean, needs the to fact be that you can draw correlations, it still I think needs it's powerful. To be, it still you needs just apply to be correlated. To I would challenge you, is you, you, you design, right? I do a lot of stuff. Okay, <laughs> okay. Then, take, then take a data set without correlation and see what you come up with. But correlation is everywhere. If we would apply correlation, let's say, to who's climate an change or something, yeah. it would be super but, useful, but, the problem, but we don't but do the that problem because it doesn't make who's any an artist? Money. Yeah, I think the problem, the problem we're trying to get at is I'm not identifying correlation. I'm not talking about technique. I mean, we have already made right. the audience. We're, we're not... We're not, we're not we're not talking about... We have already made the audience angry, so allow me to take it one step further. Yes, let's have a new question. I will, and say, I will say that the category of woman encoded in the database is the problem to begin with. Because that category was assigned by a certain patriarchal system 500 years ago, and it becomes inescapable. So the fact that we are actually aggregating data pertaining to women, pertaining to black, to indigenous, etc., that's the problem. And those are the categories that I question as form formative to the database. When they say, well, the algorithm, no, the database, the database. Okay. <laughs> so first of all, um Thank you. I think that was a great talk. I'm a little bit excited now because I never speak into a microphone, so I will breathe for a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This one is for you, this one. So I just speak uh, personally for me because I think there are lots of people who have different opinions in here, and I think that's totally fine. The only thing um, I'm missing here a little bit and I was thinking about that yesterday as well when we talked about in, in another talk where we said uh, lack of information equals happiness. <laughs> also concerning the topic we're talking about and I really, really, really don't agree with it because I think optimism is what drives us and if we don't look optimistic, we will not get anywhere. <laughs> so I think, um, I really thank you for sharing your knowledge. So. I can also share it with others, and I totally agree with you. We need to fix the culture. <laughs> and um, I just want to thank you. I don't have any question at all. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank I, you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in a way, I actually want to thank you for, for making your presence known. You deserve to be visible, and the fact that you made yourself visible, I think, is incredible. Do so you have you any that. questions to each um, other? Actually, not here because they will, here, we they will pelt us with tomatoes, <laughs> Ramon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't, I, don't. I think, I think, I think, in a way, you know, in a way, sort of pick, picking up on this last interjection. I think, in a way, this discussion, I really like it, even though it's uncomfortable and there are people who love it or hate it. But I like it because I think what it does is something that the last panel identified. It actually illuminates the tendencies that we have with this particular thing. And it actually illuminates our own discomforts with dealing with it. And I think that this is actually part of the process to the solution. So we can already see that something that seems itself to be either neutral or, or, or homogeneity already contains all of these feelings, all of this affect, all of these different opinions and even how to address it. So in a way, I can't speak for Flavia, but in a way, that's why I wouldn't want to return to the logics prior to the output. Because if we can't even sort collectively, 
what our feelings are, then, uh, then having a mode of resistance will just basically just be going in a million different types of directions. And, and we can already see what's important to me, and, and this is why I like to deal with statistics and the divine, is how easy it is when we talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence to define a morality, a value choice, it's good, it's bad, it's evil, it's this, and then we take that right to the person, which is the empirical project. This person's good in it, that person's bad in it, this per we, we can't avoid assigning these categories. But we also perpetuate the binary with Absolutely. The, the evil versus you know good. Uh, the only thing, and I hope, of course I didn't say this straight away in my lecture, but I can say it now since just disrupt the database. That's all there is left. <laughs> we have one more question, I um, believe. Yes. I, just, I just wanted to, to thank you for the uh, detailed, precise, uh, elaborate work that you've done in tracing this lineage from colonialism to the, to the algorithm. Um, and I, my, my question really was, we, we were starting to think of a response to some of the, the conference that's been going on. And yesterday we were, talking, we were thinking about Netropolitics, um, how it plays out on a moment by moment basis for black or disabled bodies as you walk through the totalization, crossing between life and death continuously. And you just like, you, you killed it in the way that you brought your stories together uh, academically as well. And so I kind of, my question really was for Ramon, um, I was really interested to hear a little bit more about um, your link and connection um, to cr black creatives who had, uh, in particular, uh, Witten's work. Um, so the series Black Monoliths and um, the idea that he's bringing to life um, people's work but without showing their faces. So I was interested in this kind of invisibility and possibility that comes from us kind of looking about back at these kind of black creative pioneers and that's what I kind of take from from both of your talks and and the relevance actually of all of this work but I wondered where are you in in that kind of thinking um, thank you for that question it's quite complex in a way um, I, I'm attempting to think through that at the end of the presentation. Um, I'm sort of just starting on this journey to think about black figuration and black abstraction. And I think, I think it just, it's, it's, I don't want to say easy to do, but that's basically the question that emerged during the civil rights movement when these, the black arts movement emerged was the idea of, can I represent Malcolm X with a triangle? You know, where's his face? Where are the politics? And then something like Jack Whitten is saying is already in the perception of this triangle. So I don't need to show his face. And then of course his adversaries would say, no, a part of this political project is that representation and that voice. So I'm trying to think about ways to sort of play with visibility. But then when I return to Fanon and Sylvia Winter and even contemporary with Fred Moten, they've already identified that that the black and racialized body is already brought into visibility through the perception of violence. That's why they kind of want to get rid of it. And they want to they want to return basically to the essence of production. That part that exists in all of us, and this isn't just a racialized thing, that part that exists in all of us that exceeds what we perceive with a very straightforward visuality. And I think in that way towards your question, I'm trying to think of ways to break the linearity, to break that causality that this must be this, and basically question the dynamism of everything. So assuming that, you know, relating this to data, assuming that a data set isn't a data set as a prerequisite for even working with the data. Not just assuming it's biased, assuming that it itself is dynamic, which means that any result I get from it can't is fragile. Right? And then assuming itself, if we think about the racialized presence and especially the black body, seeing it as a dynamic mode of being, and then backing up and seeing the violences of how Flavia said of freezing that moment into a certain space and time, and how that moment gets correlated then with other modes of perception. So in a way, I'm sort of looking at black art to think about how that, dynam how that dynamic was already being challenged and hopefully develop some type of methodology that we can apply to 
the future of black life and aesthetics. So um, hopefully I'll have an answer for you soon. I don't know, maybe a year or so. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you so much, Flavia. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you all for being with us. And a warm round of applause for our guests.